<laughs> Good morning, Bridge. Uh, how, do you, how do you follow, right, an announcement uh, uh, just like that? Uh, folks, my name is Rob, and I'm one of the staffers here at, at the Bridge, and it's great to be with the Bridge family today. Not only the Bridge family that's located in this room, but obviously our Columbia campus and those who are joining us uh, online. Uh, so again, uh, what a great opportunity that we have uh, this morning. Uh, and so the topic of today, <laughs> as we go down this series of blueprint, is just an, an all transparency, is one of those issues that I am usually very, very uncomfortable talking about. And it's the issue of conflict and how we navigate conflict. Because we all know you can't live on this planet without engaging in some type of conflict, uh, unless you want to live a life locked in a room, getting your food shoved under the door and never impact and never interacting with any other person, you and I are going to have conflict at some point. I would argue that culturally, we live in a very conflicted uh, culture. There's lots of anger and uh, lots of sound bites and lots of statements. Uh, some of them can be very, very derogatory. Um, and so, but we all approach conflict a little bit different. So for instance, some of you, like me, are what I would call conflict aversive. And all that means is you're like a turtle. So whenever there's like conflict that's getting ready to well up, what do you do? You get inside that shell and you stay there. And until you feel like it's safe and it's okay, then you will come out uh, of that shell. And so you can tend to be conflict aversive. But not everybody is conflict aversive. There are those that I would label conflict intensive. And these are individuals that you're like, you look for conflict. You're like the Tasmanian devil. You're gonna come in there and you're going, I love a good fight. I love a good argument. This is, this is how discourse is supposed to be. And so therefore, I know you're going, what's discourse? I don't know. And so, there's, so then there's that spectrum. And I know that there's all kinds of areas in between, uh, but we tend to go on both sides sides of those, and usually those are dictated by, one, our temperament, our DNA, just how God has created us, but a lot of times it's impacted by our family of origin. In other words, uh, the family that we grew up in and how they handled challenge and conflict leaves a huge stamp on how you navigate it yourself throughout the rest of your life. But uh, there's more at play going on in conflict than just temperament and just family of origin. And wouldn't it be wonderful if we could all say, you know, it's only non-Christians that have bad conflict. It's only people outside the church that don't fight well. It's only unregenerate, unredeemed, unrepentant pagans that just fight nasty and they can't get their act together. That would be so great. That's not reality. The reality is, every one of us in this room, for those of us who are in Christ, we still have the capacity to engage in sinful conflict. We still have the ability to cause tremendous amount of hurt among other people. And so uh, I'm going to go ahead and put the big idea uh, up on the screen uh, because when we have conflict, uh, we like to say naturally, it's the other person's fault. Usually the goal in conflict is who is wrong and who is right, uh, who is wiser and who is not as wise. And I would argue, I'm not sure those get us down the road very well in terms of human relationships. So maybe that's not the value that we need to adopt. So when I, I, I pastored for uh, many years uh, in Ohio, and therefore I would be involved in counseling situations, uh, and people would come in, and they would be in conflict uh, with either a boss or a coworker, a friend. A lot of times it was a spouse. And so they would come in, and usually the mindset is, pastor, I need you to tell this other person in the room that they're wrong and that they need to uh, repent. And especially when there, there were hard issues, especially like infidelity and adultery. And you can imagine uh, the popularity contest that I would not win when at the end I would say, so what is the sin in both of you? 
I wasn't much of a friend to them then because of this principle. Let's go ahead and put this up there. Uh, The war room of sinful conflict is in the confines of our own character. The war room of sinful conflict is in the confines of our own character. Let me tease some things out. First of all, do you notice the phrase sinful conflict? There are times that conflict is very necessary and there can be a nobleness, a godliness to it. So there are times we have to speak hard things or speak truth to power when there's unjust systems and actions that, are, that occur. And maybe there are times that we have to have a hard conversation about sinful patterns in somebody's life and we need to confront that and therefore there's going to be conflict. Jesus said if we follow him, it can even cause conflict within your own home. I'm talking about uh, what the majority of usually of our human conflicts are that are sinful. And where is that place? It's in the war room of our own character. This is very important to talk about as a church. You can have momentum, you can be on mission. One of our values is missional aggression. You can take territory for the glory of God, the, the cause of Christ and absolutely um, crash and burn because of not handling conflict well within the body of Christ. Jesus prayed in John 17 for us centuries ago, I pray that they may all be one with each other. That's the prayer of our Lord for us, generations and generations and generations away. But throughout history, The church has been full of conflict and and fighting. In fact, uh, in the 15th century, there was a guy by the name of Baruch Spinoza, who was a Dutch Jewish philosopher. And he observed the churches that were around him, and he said this statement centuries ago. Go ahead, put up. He says, I have often wondered that persons who make boast of professing the Christian religion namely love, joy, peace, temperance, and charity to all men should quarrel with such rancorous animosity and display daily towards one another such bitter hatred that this, rather than the virtues which they profess, is the readiest criteria of their faith. Now, The goal of today is to remind us we don't even want to be in the parking lot of this sentiment. We can argue that he's overstating. I mean, he is a philosopher. But remember, what he is basically saying is, when I observe churches around me, it's almost like how well can you tear somebody down is the criteria if you can get in church. Well, if you're like me, there's enough conflict going on in this world. There's enough brokenness going on in this world. There are relationships disintegrating enough in this world. Our prayer is that God uses the body of Christ to be a refuge of reconciliation and restoration. That is our hope. So James helps us. James uh, chapter four, I'm gonna be reading 12 verses. Um, And so uh, this is, he starts off with a rhetorical question, but it's a very blunt one. Starting verse one, he says, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this? that your passions are at war, where? Within you. You desire and you do not have, so you murder. You covet and you cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people, Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is no uh, purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us? But he gives more grace. Therefore, it says God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother judges his brother, speaks evil against the law, and judges the law. But if you judge the law... 
You are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is only one lawgiver and judge, he who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? Lord, I beg for your help. Help me to be clear. And Lord, we want you to get all glory out of our time together today. In your awesome and precious name, amen. So uh, for those of you who've been with us for a while, I'm a little bit of an outline guy. So for those of you who are keeping sermon score, the way we're gonna try to walk through (laughs) these 12 verses is I wanna talk about, first of all, the source of sinful conflict, and then I'm gonna talk about the ugliness of spiritual conflict, and then I'm gonna end with the remedy uh, for sinful conflict. So that's kind of how we're gonna flow through this. So here's the first one, the source of sinful conflict. Uh, there's that little phrase that James says, within you. Uh, I naturally want to view conflict as outside of me. It is my wife. It is our pets. It is our kids. It is my manager. It's my neighbor. In other words, I have just this reflex to just give it to anybody. But usually, the last one I give it to is usually who? Me. And so the source of conflict is inside of us. But what is it inside of us that can lead us down to sinful conflict? Well, first, inverted desires. Here's this verse that says, is it not this that your passions are at war within you? Now, that word passions is a very interesting word. Uh, In the original language, the Greek language, it's the Greek word hedonai. Uh, You you probably... uh, when you heard that go, that kind of sounds like another English word called hedonistic or hedonism. And all the worldview of hedonism says is, we live for what gives us the greatest pleasure, whatever that may be. We live for, uh, we view our jobs through a hedonistic lens, whatever's gonna give me the greatest pleasure, our spouses, our choices, really every category. Usually there's a high amount of sexual impurity that's involved in it. And so the source of sinful conflict is inside of me, and what is inside of me? It's desires. And what kind of desire is it? It's inverted desires. In other words, desires that are totally pointed to me. Uh, I, I've quoted this guy uh, before. Uh, I can't help it. I could quote him like every, every sermon because he's, he's one of my heroes. This is a guy by the name of Augustine who centuries ago said this in his book, Confessions. He says, you, talk about God, you have made us for yourself and our hearts are restless until they can find rest in you. What Augustine is saying is that God created us to have a vertical desire But the problem is sin breaks it and inverts it back on us. So therefore, we live for self-indulgence. We live for pleasure. We live for being in the center of our own universe. And so the source of sinful conflict is inverted desires. Well, guess what that breeds also within us? That means we run into a lot of blocked hopes. This is, this is what James says. You desire and you do not have. So you murder. You covet and you cannot obtain. So you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your own. And there it is again. Passions. So not only do we have inverted desires, it makes us have sinful hopes and those get blocked. And when those get blocked, we don't do well inside with that. And guess who gets the overflow of that? Our relationships. Now, I know I just read in there, wow, so you do not have, so you murder. Were there, was there actually people who did that within the church? There, there, there could have been somebody in the past who did that. Most theologians say when he uses that, that we can have the intent to murder. In other words, we know from the words of Jesus that we can have a type of anger and posture towards someone else. Even though we don't commit physical adultery, we've already killed them in terms of our, our view of them. 
So to bring this down to a real earthy level, I'm going to put a sentence up here that has a blank to it. Uh, So first, uh, I really want blank, but it's not happening. So we have inverted desires, and then we have what? Blocked hopes. So, and as we get older, this goes in past tense. I really wanted, but it never happened. And you all know, we have tons of stuff we could put in that blank, right? I, I really want a certain job, but it's not happening. I really want a certain type of spouse, but it's not happening. I really want uh, a certain raise, but it's not happening. I really want to be at a certain point at this juncture of my life, but it's not happening. And uh, folks, because of time, I, I can't go through the list, but we all have our own probably almost inexhaustible list of what we put in that blank. And so here's what happens when those things are blocked, when those things don't happen, when those things don't transpire, and we don't see the writing on the wall that what we really hope for is not happening. And it's really not fueled by God's glory. It's fueled by our own self-glory. It's fueled by our own passions. So therefore, we become what? We become angry. We become bitter. We become morose. We become dark. And here's the thing. Thoughts never stay as thoughts. They will always morph into behavior. And so that's the source of sinful conflict, our inverted desires, our blocked hopes. Well, now let's talk about the ugliness of sinful conflict. James uses some very, very um, blunt terms and phrases in this section. The ugliness of sinful conflict, here's the first one. It exposes spiritual infidelity. This is the phrase he uses. You adulterous people. In fact, in the original language, it's actually rendered you adulteresses. What is that? It's spiritual infidelity. He does not say you who don't know your scriptures enough. You who are not doing enough, do you notice the metaphor he uses? He goes right to relationship. You adulterous people. Well, then, what else is ugly about sinful conflict? It exposes spiritual treason. It says, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? In other words, folks, we can spout all the verses that we want. We can sing all the songs that we want. But if we have war against someone else in our heart, we may be singing to someone who's against us. God is against that. Because it exposes spiritual infidelity and exposes spiritual treason. At first, this verse bothered me because it says, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? And I'm like, wait a minute, aren't we... Aren't we supposed to, we're in the world, but we're not of the world. Aren't we supposed to love the, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son and our neighbors, we're supposed to love our neighbors. They exist in the world. What James is getting at is what John was talking about in 1 John 2, 16. It says, for all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. In other words, Bridge, we are definitely to love the world, but we are not to conduct our lives by the operation system of the world. In fact, our most, our most powerful witness is when we are in the muck and mire of the world, engaging with all kinds of people, no matter the condition where they may be, and yet we are pursuing personal holiness in our own life that glorifies Christ. And when people, people want to see a contrast, people don't want to see us just like them making the same type of choices, no. They want to see the jewel of Jesus. And so the ugliness of sinful conflict exposes spiritual infidelity and it exposes spiritual treason. Now, my, my wife and I, we've been married for 24 years. Her name is Angela. 
We are both conflict aversive. So let me tell you what that means. That means we build up and we build because we don't want to rock anything. But at some point, it comes out. And in that moment, do you know who I am convinced is the issue? It's her. Wait, who, who just said, somebody said amen right there. We're going to do church discipline right here, right in the middle of the... That was really funny, by the way. I don't even know where I am. Okay. But do you all agree with me that when we are in conflict with another human being, we usually think of it right in that moment of what's going on with the other person, the circumstances around us, our schedules. Honestly, the last thing we're thinking is that we're having an affair on God and we're working against him. There is always a vertical dimension to our conflicts. And so, the remedy, the ugliness of sinful conflict, it exposes spiritual infidelity, it exposes spiritual treason, but now let's talk about the remedy. The remedy for spiritual conflict. So, the first one is, we get low. In other words, we pursue something that's beautiful called humility. This is what it says. He yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us, but he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. He doesn't say he gives grace to the most talented. He doesn't say I give grace to the most competent. He doesn't give grace to people who look a certain way. He, no, he just says, I give grace to the humble. In fact, if you're like me, that phrase, but he gives more grace. That is really good news for me. Because if God is human, I would have capped out his grace at two years old of age. But the fact of the matter is that we have a God that when repentance is engaged and we get low, he has an inexhaustible spring of grace. We get low. We pursue humility. Donald Gray Barnhouse, the great theologian, once said this. He says, Christ sends none away empty, but those who are full of themselves. Now listen, don't look at this as a certain group of super Christians. We are all full of ourselves. We wake up full of ourselves. But... Christ sends none away empty, but those who are full of themselves. We get low. Growth in the Christian life, healing in our relationships will never happen outside of humility. You can have all the people skills in the world. You can have gifts like crazy in the world. I'm telling you, the way to succeed is humility. Growth starts in humility. One of my uh, heroes is a guy by the name of Jonathan Edwards. And the reason why is he's influenced a lot of my heroes. Jonathan Edwards first president of Princeton, died just a few days later. Some people argue probably one of the greatest American philosopher theologians that this culture has ever turned out. He thought often about the glory of God. And he also existed at a time called the Great Awakening. And I know some of you are new to church and so let me just say it like this. There was a point in American history where there were two great awakenings, where there was something called a revival that happened with God's church in America that spilled outside of the church and was so powerful, it actually impacted society. And then they stopped. So Jonathan Edwards, the intellect that he is, 
went on an investigation to try to learn how, how these stopped, what stopped these great awakenings. And he found a very, very simple conclusion, fighting. Christians fighting, quarreling. So in his book, Thoughts on Revival, he made out a list of six um, kind of things about spiritual pride as opposed to humility. First, spiritual pride makes you more aware of others' faults than your own, while humility disposes you to be far more aware of your own faults than others. Spiritual pride, number two, leads you to have an air of contempt and disdain about other people's faults. But humility, when you speak of other people's thoughts, it's always tinged with grief and mercy. Spiritual pride causes you to separate from people who you've criticized or who criticize you, while humility sticks with people even through difficult relationships. You don't give up on them. Fourthly, a proud person is dogmatic and sure about every point of belief. Proud people cannot distinguish between major and minor points of belief because everything is a major point. Fifthly, a proud person either loves to confront because you like winning or proud people refuse to confront because you don't want criticism or controversy. But a humble person confronts when it's necessary. I tend to be... Um, an Eeyore type of a guy, just to be all, just to be transparent, I can definitely devolve into self-pity. So I do not like this last one that Jonathan Edwards says. Edwards says, a proud person is often unhappy and sorry for himself. Here's the reason why. Proud people are filled with self-pity because first, they're so sure they know how life ought to go, and secondly, they're sure they deserve a good life. But humble, humble people say, I deserve to be cast off, but only by the God's grace am I living. Amen. Amen. So we go low. Second thing to remember in this passage is remember the ultimate enemy. Yes. Remember the ultimate enemy. When we're in the throes of that conflict and kids are going crazy and job is going crazy, in that moment, that other person in the room is the enemy. Nope. Remember the ultimate enemy all the time. This is what James says, submit yourself therefore to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. There is always a spiritual and I would also argue also a demonic element to issues of human conflict, especially sinful conflict. And, and this is just a, uh, an aside sermon. This is just kind of a, an, an addendum. Followers of Jesus, we are not called unilaterally all by ourselves to go against the devil because we lose. The way that we engage in a battle is we go to our Father and He takes care of it. That's why it says we submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and He will flee. Next thing, prayerfully mourn over your sin. These are strong words from him. Clean your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. Have you ever asked yourself, why, why do I stay in these cycles of sin? Why do I keep having these crazy interactions, people, that are always hurtful, and I can't get over that. Usually it's because we're not really mourning over our sin. If you're like me, we can usually go, oh, this is wrong. Lord, forgive me. Okay, what's next on my schedule? Does that make sense? But see, the Christian life is not a video game. When we lose, we're like, oh, we press reset. We're sinning against a person. We mourn. See, the reason we mourn our sin, it keeps our heart soft. It keeps us pliable. It keeps us close to the ground. It keeps us dependent upon the Lord. Prayerfully mourn over your sin. And then the last one, turn over the gavel. Turn over the gavel. At the very end, James says, 
when you are slandering other people, you are putting yourself in the position of a judge and you're trying to rewrite the law. And according to Leviticus, we are to love our neighbors and not slander them. But when we ignore it and go against it, we now are writing our own laws and writing our own ethics, and we have placed ourselves as what? Judge. And man, oh, that gavel metaphor is huge with me. It's so, <laughs> there's probably more than you want to know. It, it is so easy for me in my little self-righteous mind that when people don't do things the way I want them to or have opinions different, I, I can have a mental gavel in my mind. <laughs> Insecure. You just, you're just misinformed. You're just dumb. You are just like other people who have hurt me. Do you know? I could keep going. And isn't it funny how we all get in our little judges' seats and we have our little gavels and we just do verdicts sometimes day in, day out. It is so freeing, isn't it? To turn over the dumb gavel. Um, earlier this month, there was a story that really brought all of our culture to attention. One of the most powerful expressions of the gospel I personally have seen in a long time. It didn't happen in a church service. It didn't happen at a Christian leadership conference. It wasn't on a podcast. It was in a courtroom. I'm sure as I continue to speak, immediately you're, you're going to know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the case of Amber Geiger, a police officer thinking that Botham Jean was in her apartment, therefore an intruder, and she takes his life. We've all been probably trying to keep up with the case. And then earlier this month, they had the sentencing. I wish, honestly, there was more that we could have heard from the mom about what does justice look like in those situations. But I will probably never forget that moment that Botham's younger brother, Brant, 18 years old, goes up to the stand, sits down, and he looks at that woman who took his brother's life. Here's an excerpt of some of the things he said. I know if you go to God and ask him, he will forgive you. I love you just like anyone else. And I am not going to hope that you rot and die. I personally want the best for you. I don't even want you to go to jail. I want the best for you because I know that's exactly what Botham would want for you. Then she said, give your life to Christ. I think giving your life to Christ is the best thing Botham would want for you. And then she looks up at that judge. He looks up at that judge. Says, "Can I hug her? Can I give her a hug?" And he walks off. And he bear hugs Amber Geiger. He could have held on to an emotional historical gavel, couldn't he? For the rest of his life. But what did he do? And he offered grace. Hey folks, all of us are born theologically in the position of Amber Geiger. We have entered into creation, God's domain, and we have sinned against him. 
We have committed spiritual infidelity against the holiness of God. We have committed treason against God. He has the right to get the gavel to say, you are done, you are over. But thanks be to God, he sent his son. Who took on the gavel? He took our verdict. He walked out of the tomb and through his Holy Spirit, he comes to us wretched sinners and says, ah, you are mine. You are mine. Listen. Where are you today? Are you in the midst of a conflict? You hear inwardly just angry, bitter, down all the time because how you've been hurt. I by no means am making light of it. I by no means am condoning anybody doing anything negative. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is, do you wanna be free? Do you wanna be free? Do you wanna be controlled by the wrong actions of other people against you? Do you really wanna be controlled by any of that? Or do you wanna be controlled by the Holy Spirit and live as adopted sons and daughters of God? After I pray, there are gonna be people up front and they're gonna be available to you for prayer. And if you need to come to them and say, hey, I need prayer about a situation going on. I need prayer about a conflict that I'm having. I wanna encourage you to do that. Lord, Heavenly Father, thank you for your son. Thank you for sending your son to defeat the greatest conflict ever known. And that was our conflict with you. Lord, I pray that there will be restoration of relationships, that there will be forgiveness offered, there will be grace given. And Lord, thank you, thank you, thank you for Jesus. In your awesome and precious name, amen. Well, hey, thank you so much for watching the Bridge Church YouTube channel. We're so glad you joined us. We hope that you felt the welcome home of Christ right through your screen. Um, Here at the Bridge, we believe that the gospel is good news worth sharing. And so we'd love for you to subscribe to our channel, to share on social media, and you can tag us at at BridgeChurchTN. That's at Bridge Church TN. And if you'd like to give to this ministry, you can do so by clicking the link in the description of the video. Hey, once again, thank you so much for joining us. If you want to find out more information about the Bridge Church, you can go to bridge.tv. That's bridge.tv. And we hope to see you here soon.